Hi, my name is Michael Wild, and today I'm going to be talking about high performance stream processing engines. I'm going to walk through how we designed Arroyo, a new streaming engine, to be faster and easier to use than the existing streaming engines out there. So let's get started. Uh, a little bit about me. I have spent kind of my entire career trying to make streaming happen, trying to push companies that operate on batch processing, who, who process data every hour or day or week into more real-time processing modes. It's taken a few different forms across ad tech, anti-fraud, more recently uh, leading streaming teams at Splunk and Lyft. And now I've started a company that is trying to really take that next step for streaming, making it mainstream for all sorts of companies. And uh, as part of that, we're building in a new streaming engine called Arroyo. So Arroyo is a stateful stream processing engine. It's programmed using SQL. It's designed to do stateful operations like aggregations, windows, joins at very high scale, millions of events per second. And it's designed for everyone to be able to use, people who are product engineers or data engineers or data scientists, and to be easy to operate on modern cloud environments where resources come and go. What is a stateful stream processing engine? It, it's basically something that turns a pipeline definition, which in Arroyo takes the form of a SQL query like this, and converts it into something called a state flow, stateful data flow graph. That data flow graph is made up of operators that do some potentially stateful operation, and then, uh, read data from some, some input and then produce data to the next uh, operator in that graph. So here we have, uh, for example, sources that are reading from Kafka, doing some processing and eventually producing a result to their consumers. This talk is gonna be about performance, but before we can talk about performance, first we have to talk about what does it mean to be fast for a streaming engine. What is performance? For a batch engine, this is pretty straightforward. Performance is like, how long does it take when I hit enter on my query before I see the results? Or how many CPUs does it take to get results within, within a certain amount of time? But in a streaming engine, this is much more multidimensional. So some of the things that people might mean about mean by performance in a streaming engine, uh, one is end-to-end -end latency. So how long does it take for an event that comes in from our source to produce an output out, uh, out of the uh, sync? So in this graph, sort of the difference between T2 and T1. For some use cases, this needs to be in the microseconds. For other use cases, maybe seconds or minutes is acceptable. Another thing people think uh, mean by performance is throughput which is given a stream of a million events per second, how many CPU cores do I need to process that? And because we don't have the option in streaming to just wait longer, we have to keep up with the input data. You can also think this is basically cost. How, how much does it cost me to run a stream, a, a computation against a stream of a certain size? Another thing we care about is consistency of performance. So if we have a downstream consumer that needs our, our outputs on a regular schedule in order to power some, some further process, we might care a lot that uh, we're able to consistently produce results within a certain latency. Unfortunately, that's complicated by the fact that these systems also have to checkpoint their state for fault tolerance. We might be processing data over uh, days or weeks, and we may not keep around all of the input data that goes into that computation. So these systems themselves need to checkpoint their state in order to be able to recover it consistently and continue processing in the case of failure. We also maybe care that we're able to do that frequently in order to recover fast. If we are only able to checkpoint every minute or every hour, we will have a lot of data to replay on recovery. And to our downstream consumers, that just looks like higher latency. So 
I spent a lot of time working with the previous generation of streaming engines and incorporate a lot of those lessons into Arroyo, how we can build a better, faster, easier engine. And I'm gonna talk through some of those design decisions with a performance focus, how we built a fast engine, learning the lessons of the previous generation. The first design decision we made with Arroyo before really we'd done anything was to use Rust. The previous generation of engines, Flink, Spark Streaming, KSQL, et cetera, were all written in Java, which was kind of, or Scala, which was kind of the obvious choice in like the early 2010s when all those systems were, were built. But I think today the obvious choice is clearly Rust. It's not only a really ergonomic, at least for me, pleasant language to write in, but it also really makes you think about what you're doing in a way that is really valuable for these long running systems that need to stably operate performantly over time. It also really uh, makes developers think about the performance of what they're doing. There's often the ability to kind of opt into lower performance pathways. The, the most common one is to use the clone function, which copies your data rather than making you think about how to share it safely. But Rust always makes you think about the fact that you're doing that and always makes you opt into lower performance. And it's absolutely possible to write high-performance Java I spent a large chunk of my career doing that. You see high-performance Java trading systems, streaming systems, data systems. But high-performance Java tends to look like this. Not to pick on the, the source of this code, but when you're writing high-performance Java, you have to throw out most of what makes the language nice. You have to throw out classes and allocations and garbage collection. And you end up writing sort of C in Java a lot of arrays of primitives and unsafe operations. Whereas in Rust, high-performance Rust is just Rust. The Rust language and standard library are focused around zero-cost abstractions. The philosophy is that you should not have to give up performance to use high-level features. And so in Rust, we have things like iterators, we have async await, and, and other uh, traits, functions, high-level high features that operate at the same performance level as the kind of low-level code you would write yourself. So an iterator compiles to the same LLM bit code as a, a handwritten for loop. Async await is the same state machine that you would write yourself if you were doing this by hand. And this philosophy of performance also just kind of infects the community. And we get to take advantage of that by uh, all the kind of like third-party libraries we use also have that kind of performance consideration. So I, I think that's really helped give us uh, a few X improvement on top of like the previous systems, just by allowing us to uh, really focus on performance without compromising the ability to write nice code. The next decision we made was to use columnar processing. So I'm sure you're all familiar with columnar processing. It's the standard approach in OLAP batch query systems, but it's much more rare, maybe unknown in stream processing. As far as I know, we're the only production stream processing engine that uses columnar processing. And the reason it's great for performance, you know, it, it aligns well with modern CPUs, it reduces data copies, it uh, allows us to use vector processing, which can give three to five X speedups. And yet, it's not popular in streaming for this pretty simple reason, that in order to have columns, we have to batch our data. A column of one record is just a row. And if we're batching, that means we have to introduce latency while we wait for the events to come in to be batched. And so streaming engines, which historically have been focused uh, really on low latency processing, have avoided this approach in favor of row at a time processing. But I think this is much less of an issue than people generally assume. And the argument for that is sort of this chart here. So if you have a really low data volume, if we're processing 10 events per second, it'll take you a really long time to build up a reasonable batch size. If we want a batch size of 128 events, then we have to wait you know, 10 plus seconds to fill that up with a 10 event per second uh, input stream. 
On the other hand, if we're processing 10 events per second, it honestly doesn't really matter what we do. We can just have a, a column of one row and it, it'll basically be fine because you can do anything at, at, at that data scale and still be reasonably performant. Meanwhile, if we have a really high uh, data stream, if we are processing 100 events per sec, 100,000 events per second, then it actually takes us almost no time at all to fill up a reasonably sized batch. The 128 element batch only takes a millisecond. And so what we see is that when we really need performance at the highest data volumes, we actually don't pay very much of a latency cost to batch at all. And meanwhile, we get huge benefits in throughput. But we also recognize that some users are very latency sensitive and are willing to pay a throughput overhead for that. And so we allow users to specify where they would like to be on this latency throughput trade-off by setting how long they want to wait in order to fill up an, an ideal batch size. Using columnar formats also allows us to use Apache Arrow, which has been extremely beneficial for our performance. Arrow gives us zero copy data flow between our operators. Because data is arranged in immutable columns, we don't have to pay to copy any of the data that is not touched in a particular operator. When you're building out these data flow graphs, it's common to have operators that are only looking at one column, but need to forward on the rest of the data further into the, into the data flow graph. And so we're able to do that extremely cheaply, just passing around references to these immutable arrays. And then when uh, we're doing remote uh, communication, when we are running in a distributed mode, we can use the really efficient Arrow IPC format. Arrow is also great for doing high-performance UDFs. So because Arrow is a standardized in-memory format, we're able to just pass off memory, for example, to a Python UDF. And there it can be read with PyArrow and brought into the whole Python data processing ecosystem without ever copying the data. The last performance topic I'm going to talk about here is streaming checkpoints, how we do checkpoints efficiently and quickly in order to speed up recovery time. So the goal here is to capture a globally consistent snapshot of every operator's state. We want to capture a snapshot where for every event, it's either been seen by every operator and stored in their state or by no operator. This is really important in order to consistently recover in such a way that we don't drop data or double count data. You might imagine if we're doing, for example, a count operation, it's really problematic if an event is is stored in both uh, in both the operator before the count and the operator after the count, because then we'll we'll recount it and we'll end up with the wrong result. Having a globally consistent snapshot even allows us to do end to end exactly once, so long as our sources and syncs support some kind of like transactional uh, mode. The way this actually works uses kind of an old idea. It's a algorithm from the godfather of distributed systems, Leslie Lamport, called the Chandy Lamport. Uh, checkpointing algorithm. And the details don't particularly matter, but for this discussion, what matters is that we have uh, in our data stream a checkpoint barrier that gets inserted alongside the data. When each operator receives a checkpoint barrier from one of its inputs, and you can see here some operators will have multiple inputs, they have to wait for what's called alignment. They have to wait for the checkpoint barrier to come in on all of their inputs before they're able to checkpoint their own state and then forward on the barriers. And that alignment is what gives us this globally consistent uh, property of this algorithm. However, this alignment also can introduce latency. While we're waiting for the other barriers to come in, we're not processing events. So our goal in designing an efficient snapshotting algorithm is to minimize that latency, to make sure that all of these operations happen as quickly as possible so that we don't impact overall processing latency. The way this works in Arroyo is in a streaming fashion. So traditional uh, streaming engines relied on on-disk LSM trees like RocksDB, and their checkpointing system basically uh, flushes their RocksDB state to disk, and then in the background uploads it to some kind of external storage. These days, typically an object store like S3 Whereas in Arroyo, we had the advantage of designing in an era when object stores were already, already existed and already really fast. And so we focused on directly streaming our state to object storage rather than having this on-disk 
uh, step in the middle. And that allows us to make this much faster and much lower impact. The way it works is like this. On the right, we have an operator that is processing events on coming in on the left, doing some, some uh, operation on that, which is potentially stateful. So it's updating uh, its state. It does that in two ways. It updates an internal B tree map that serves reads, and then it also writes it to a queue. And then it's able to do its whatever stable processing it needs to do, its join, aggregation, whatever. Periodically, that queue is compacted and written into object storage. So every time we get enough uh, data there that it makes sense to do a multi-part write to S3, we'll do that. And then when a checkpoint comes in, so our, uh, our input here to the operator is blocked by this checkpoint, that checkpoint barrier gets written also into the queue. And then all we have to do in the storage system is just do that normal flush operation. We don't have to do anything special. We're doing the thing we're doing constantly every like 100 milliseconds. And so it's very light, uh, lightweight, low impact when we're actually handling that barrier. You can think of this as kind of pushing the checkpoint into the storage system itself. Once we flush the data, we complete the file and start a new file. We tell the operator we're good to go and it's able to continue. This whole process takes just like five to 10 milliseconds. So the impact on processing is very low. However, over time, we end up with a lot of files and that can really slow down recovery because we have to download all those files and we have to process the duplicates and deletes and so on. And so we also have a compaction process that's able to rewrite these files into a more efficient format. The compaction process works also in a streaming fashion. So we uh, stream in the data into a compactor process, uh, which is part of the control plane. And the data gets compacted according to the semantics of the table and the current watermark time. I think it's something also fairly unique. We push uh, the logical state of the table into our, uh, our actual storage system. So we know uh, kind of what data is going to be needed in the future based on the way we do time-oriented processing. So a couple of interesting optimizations here. One is that uh, we do external merge sort as part of our compaction so that we don't have to read in all of the data into the compactor and potentially run out of memory there. And then we're also able to drop data if we know based on our watermark that it's never going to be read again. Watermarks are, for those who are not familiar, an estimate of completeness that are used as part of time-oriented window processing. So we have like a tumbling window that processes every hour, and we have data that can never be part of a future tumbling window then we can just drop it out of our state. Once we've compacted the state and produced the new compacted file, we write that back to S3 and update our internal metadata, communicate to the, the engine that uh, the, the checkpoint files have changed, and then we're able to delete the existing file. Now in recovery, the uh, workers only need to read just one compacted file rather than like all of these uh, uh, other files that they would then need to merge. We're also able to do a specialized form of compaction that's extremely cheap for tables that are time oriented. So again, these like streaming windows where we know we have a, an event at 1037 in this file and our watermark has passed that. So we're never going to need to look at that data again. <clears throat> the compactor knows about that and is able to just drop the file immediately without doing any expensive compaction process. So those are a few performance details of the Aurora system. Hopefully. You enjoyed this. It was interesting. If you have any questions, comments, please get in touch. And thank you for watching.